Hello everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for today's sermon from Praise Assembly of God here at 89 Congress Street. Hope you enjoy this message and if you have any feedback you'd like to offer feel free to give me a call at 207-364-3856 or my cell phone 207-357-4748. Again, enjoy today's message. Thanks. Um, professional ethics class or communications class is what they used to call it. You say Happy New Year for through the first 10 days and after that it's no longer proper etiquette so you don't have to feel guilty if you forgot to say someone happened to Happy New Year after the 10th. But that's neither here nor there. Tell somebody Happy New Year on the 20th is fine too, you know, but as far as the professionalism etiquette. But we are going to pick back up with our Daniel series and last week just as a brief review, uh, we saw where Daniel had the vision of the four beasts interpreted for him so that he would have a better understanding of what was going on um, around him. And, and so we read uh, and we studied verses uh, 15 down to uh, 28 with the, uh, the vision uh, interpreted, especially with more information about the unique beast, the country of Rome. Daniel was uh, intrigued and he asked questions of the servant of the Lord uh, regarding questions about Rome, uh, the unique beast. And so that was our, our biggest uh, talking point. And of course, out of the unique beast comes the little horn, the pompous one, the antichrist, uh, who is going to attempt to take over the kingdom of God. And of course, we know uh, that God's kingdom is going to reign forever and be supreme, not only to the four beasts that Daniel envisioned, but throughout history. We understand, and Revelation, of course, is going to confirm this of how these details are going to unfold, but we understand that uh, Jesus Christ and his kingdom is going to be uh, victorious. And so uh, that's pretty um, that's pretty exciting uh, there, the greatness of God's kingdom, uh, that we will reign with God, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom will be everlasting. All dominions will serve Him. And this will be the end of the great account, uh, which of course will usher in the millennial reign of Christ, uh, as well as the 1,000 year uh imprisonment, if you will, of the unholy trinity, Satan, the Antichrist, and the uh, false prophet. And so, um, and then lastly there in verse 28, Daniel kept this matter in his heart, meaning it impacted his prayer life, it impacted his ministry, as at the time of this vision, Belshazzar was king, Babylon was the superpower, and King Darius was about to overtake them. But Daniel kept this in his heart to the very end of his life, uh, so it impacted him greatly. Uh, and I believe it also was matters in which he was praying about, when if you know the story of, of Darius' governors who tricked Daniel uh, to pray uh, so that uh, they could get rid of him um, a few years later. And of course Daniel went into the lion's den, God would shut the mouths of the lions, and the governors would be fed to the lions, and God was not going to shut the mouths this time, and uh, God's righteousness was confirmed and, and through Daniel's faithfulness and his servanthood unto the Lord. Okay, and so today we are going to shift now to Daniel chapter 8, the vision of the ram and the goat. Okay, and so we have a different animal, but we're going to see two different animals, but we're going to see two countries that we've already talked about with Persia and Greece. And we're going to, especially when we get to the interpretation of this, because the angel Gabriel is going to come down and help out Daniel to have full clarity of the vision uh, that is given. However, before this happens, also during the reign of Belshazzar, uh, this is, so this is before Persia conquers Babylon, is that Daniel is going to get a division of the ram and the goat. And of course, we're going, if you know anything about a male ram and a male goat, they're going to have horns. However, they're two very different species, okay? And we're going to see, though, where you could have a, a situation where the underdog prevails, okay? Again, this vision 
gives us great credibility to Daniel as a prophet and a man of God because all his prophecy, as it is tested even after Daniel is dead and long gone from this earth, his, his prophecy is tested, his prophecy is confirmed, which, which is John later would tell us to test the prophets, test the word of God, test the spirit, okay? And so uh, Daniel can be defined as credible because these prophecies 100% were carried out, uh, up, up, uh, obviously not yet regarding the second coming and the tribulation, but up and through the, the things that he proclaimed uh, with uh, countries rising up and has been confirmed, which gives us, hopefully, credibility in God because it is God's Word, it is God's Holy Spirit that is coming forth through uh, the Bible, and in this case, the book of Daniel. All right, and so let's take a look here uh, in uh, Daniel chapter 8, and we're going to pick up with the first verse. And I will be reading from the New King James Version. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. Okay, the one he's referring to is the vision of the four beasts, and now his, uh, the vision of the Ancient of Days, now he has the vision that we're going to talk about or start talking about today. Notice we're still Belshazzar, uh, therefore Babylon is the superpower of the world, meaning the Babylonian captivity is still ongoing. And uh, Daniel, though, is still faithful to the Lord. He does not permit the circumstances around him to tear him down. He does not permit all the frustration and pain that he sees going on around him to just become apathetic. Matter of fact, I think it increases his faith to go forth and to shine for God himself. Okay, and so uh, Daniel is writing this, so it's really an autobiography, if you will. And Daniel tells us firsthand what he is about to see. The reason I'm against saying that, because it gives us great credibility. Daniel had an eyewitness account, not only of the, uh, the first two visions, but he has an eyewitness account of this vision. And of course, this vision uh, is going to be interpreted by Gabriel when we get down to verse 15, okay? And so Daniel is, is showing us he's not just blowing smoke. He's not just some, you know, some something that he heard of. This is something that he saw and he records it. And some people would say, well, this is just a fairy tale, you know, just like any, you know, prophet today. It's not a fairy tale if it happens. And if it continues to happen, event after event, nation after nation, as Daniel predicted while under the anointing of the Holy Spirit with these visions, that can give us great credibility that when, we, when it comes to the rapture, the second coming of Christ, the tribulation, we can take to the bank that these events are going to unfold to a T. Now, I just want to briefly tell you a, a teaching that's growing faster and faster and some scholars believe maybe even as much as 30 to 40 percent of evangelical Christians are now believing, and that's something called replacement uh, theology or a replacement doctrine, which means that God has replaced uh, all the prophecy about the Jewish people and the servants with the church, meaning that the church has replaced the, the Christians have now replaced God's chosen people, the Israelites. Uh, this is a teaching, and a big piece is, is because how do we know that God has not changed if Jesus said, you know, Jew, and Ephesians, Jew or Gentile, both can be saved, therefore both have the same luxuries uh, that the Jews had. Well, the bottom line is that would completely cause prophecy, rather than to become literal, to become figurative. And therefore, the characters change. Please do not fall for this jargon of replacement theology. We can take to the bank the characters that not only the prophet Ezekiel names, the prophet Daniel names, the countries, the nations, the individuals, and as well as the role of Israel, you can take to the bank are going to unfold. 
Uh, and so this is extremely important. I don't want anyone here to fall for that false teaching of replacement theology. Uh, that is a, uh, a big, big mistake when you look at the prophecy of, of uh, our Lord and Savior. Yes, hon? Wouldn't it make sense that if replacement theology was accurate, then that means the Jehovah's Witnesses are also accurate, that there's only going to be 200,000 people in, in heaven? Yeah, and so, and so yeah, 144,000, yeah, exactly. And, and then Gentiles, select number of Gentiles, and so that's usually the number that they throw out, about 200,000. Yeah, yeah, that opens up a can of worms to a lot of different opinions, uh, which takes away from the credibility as well as the God's word being very literal when it comes to prophecy. So you open that can, it's kind of like the can of worms we opened with, with opening marriage to, to, to uh, people or whatever you want to say, and now you've got, well, if it's two, why can't it be three? And of course the Mormons are pushing a lawsuit for polygamy out of Utah. So if you can be married to one at the same time, why can't you be married to two? You've got the bestiality people, two lawsuits that have been filed, that they want to marry their dog and other animals, uh, this type of thing. It opens up a can of worms, and, and, and certainly replacement theology does that. So please, please stick with the literal word of God. Yes, Mary. Uh, would Kenneth Copeland be among those that's coming with that replacement? Yes, Kenneth Copeland talks about it a lot. Uh, I felt yes, yes, uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Dollar talks about it a lot. Uh, Joel Osteen talks about it a lot. Uh, yeah, and and so so yeah. There's uh, Hagen talked about it. Uh, the ones that are not talking about, it, of course, David Jeremiah, uh, John Hagee, uh, Franklin Graham. Uh, so you do have you do have some saints of God that are in have large platforms encouraging people not to fall for that. Uh, but unfortunately, just like with prosperity teaching, and Jesus warns us in Matthew 24, beware of false teaching in the last day. Uh, the Jews will always have a special place uh, in heaven, during the tribulation, and forever. Yes, Don. So, going back to Alexander, when he took over, you know, Greece, Alexander the Great, yeah. Right, yeah. He read about himself and knew it was prophesied Yes, about him. he did. So, Yes, the Alexander the Great, uh, he sure did. And even though Daniel had been dead for 200 years by then, he knew, uh, especially once his father, King Philip II, was gone, and Alexander the Great took great prominence, and Greece came to power so quickly, he knew he was the leopard. Right. No doubt about it. Unfortunately, he knew it, and therefore he knew that they would fall to power quickly. So once he was gone at the age of 32, uh, he didn't put much weight into who would succeed him other than the four governors, which Daniel said, north, south, east, west. Yeah. And he had them in four different areas. And of course, they crumbled like snow uh, very quickly to uh, to the Romans. Yes? Um, I just, I guess, reading notes, said that, um, says that chapter 7 was written in Aramaic and chapter 8 in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why. Well, Daniel, Daniel was fluent in both. Daniel, Daniel was raised in, in Babylon. Uh, Daniel was, I mean, he was taken out of Israel very young, but his life was Babylon. He stayed there. He never returned to his holy land. If you saw the, if you were here for dinner and movie night when we showed Daniel, it talked about that. Uh, when he's talking to us, King Cyrus at the end, who was the final king of Daniel's life after Darius, and then you go to King Cyrus, uh, you, um, uh, Daniel, would, very common for him to, Sometimes he would use his own birth name at times, and, and through different translations and publications of the Bible, we stick with Daniel. But many times he would stick with his birth name. His birth name was not Daniel; it was um, Belshazzar. Yeah, so he would he would call himself that, unless typically Belshazzar was it was during the Babylon time where Belshazzar was king. Yes, yes, and when, yes, Aramaic was the regular routine, everyday language, yes. But Daniel was, Daniel was an extremely brilliant uh, man, uh, which, uh, you know, I take great honor in the fact that my parents named me after him, uh, you know, because of, one, his prayer life and his faithfulness, uh, but, but two, 
uh, the way he carried himself uh, was just, uh, just amazing. Okay, so verse number two. I saw in the vision, and so it happened, while I was looking that I was in Shushan, the, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in the vision that I was by the river uh, Uli. So here, you're referring to what is, uh, anyone know what is Elam today? Uh, it's in the Persian Gulf. Uh, yep, it's the Persian Gulf region. Years, you know, you know, the two, um, northern ends of Okay, yes, so right through right through that area. Okay, so here's here's Daniel. He is he is in a place, he gives us the setting of what he is about to see. And what this is going to be symbolic of is that there's not only going to be change, there's going to be rapid change, there's going to be a a surprise that's going to take place. Now this surprise is on two fronts. The surprise of the Persians conquering Belshazzar and the Babylons quickly once the handwriting was on the wall, as well as the surprise that Alexander the Great and the Greeks, or what would be the goat, is going to come out of nowhere and take out the top dog very, very quickly. America, uh, right now, we've only been the superpower, a uh, sole superpower since the fall of communism in 1991, so 25 years. Alexander the Great, he comes to power much, much faster than that. And, and, of course, we, you know, were a joint superpower with the Soviet Union during the Cold War and the years after World War II, okay? And so, I mean, we, we were very much a baby nation, but Al and, 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 of course, became a nation in 1776. Alexander the Great is going to come to power very quickly out of nowhere, and it's going to be an, an ultimate surprise, okay? Uh, and Daniel had predicted this you know, years before it happened, as far as the Greeks and the Persians, okay? Of course, he was alive. He saw firsthand Persia conquer the Babylon, the Babylonians, okay? And so here is Daniel, verse 3, Then I lifted my eyes and saw there standing beside the river was a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last, okay? Now, when we get to the interpretation next week, I don't want to... It's kind of like I don't want to give you the, the movie without you seeing the movie, but I want to just give the information and bring forth the illustration. So Daniel's down by the river, and he has a ram with two horns with one that's higher than another. It almost, if you've ever seen a hippopotamus, you know, something like that, you, you can kind of picture this, this ram, uh, if you will, okay, with, with the two horns, and the higher one came up last. Okay, so the, that's, very, uh, that's very interesting because typically if you're down by the river, you're going to see the higher one first. But this one comes up last. Again, symbolic of surprise. Symbolic of things that are going to not be the norm. Therefore, it's abnormal. It's, it's, a, little, it's, a, little, uh, it's a little shocking. Okay, and so remember, when God is doing something amazing, it's not going to appear logical from man's eyes. Okay, but with God, we have to understand that he works, as he told the prophet Isaiah 200 years before this, his ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Okay, and so when God is up to something amazing, our job is to simply believe and trust him and have a full understanding. And of course, if it's, an, it's a, a vision, as we talked about the last couple of weeks, if God gives you a vision, ask him for the interpretation. God is not the author of confusion. Okay, and so uh, here we have the higher one comes up last. Okay, and we're going to, again, just picture this in your head, and we're going to talk about what this all means in the, in the coming classes, okay? I don't want to let the cat out of the bag yet. I, wanna, I want you guys to see it, understand it, as Daniel tells it to us uh, in the order that he so chose, okay? And so verse 4, I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. But he did according to the will and be, according to his will, and became 
great. So here is Daniel as he sees this ram, as he sees the larger horn coming up last, and as he sees uh, this ram pushing westward, which of course is going to be uh, toward uh, Israel, toward the Mediterranean Sea, or what they call the Great Sea, northward and southward. He didn't have to worry about the east because the ram had already conquered that land. Okay, he did not, that's where they came from. Okay, if, if, you're, if you're defeating people, you're not watching your back door because that's where you just came through cleaning house. You know, uh, you know typically, for example, uh, the best illustration that I could come up with is if, you are a, if you're in Oklahoma and you are a tornado chaser and you are chasing a tornado, you never look behind you. You're looking in all three directions in front of you and to the left and the right because you've already come from behind. Okay, unless there's a second tornado, which is theoretically and scientifically possible, you know, but you're looking in front and you're looking out your, your, your right window, your mirror, your, your, you know, out your window, your right, the passenger window, the driver window, you're not looking out the rear view mirror because the tornado is in front of you. Well, it's the same thing here. Notice that tornado left a path of destruction behind it. You don't want to look back because that's probably very destroyed land, you know, as, okay. And so here is, here is, um, here is this ram. And as it is pushing westward, it is pushing northward, it is pushing southward. And Daniel tells us so that no animal could withstand him. Okay, so that means he's getting stronger. It's getting, it's getting, the longer a tornado is on the ground, the wider it's most likely going to get. And that if you remember last May during the Women's College World Series, Softball World Series, that one tornado was one and a quarter miles wide. And it stayed down on the ground and it tore up Jack and the World Series was delayed a few days because it just ripped through Oklahoma. Okay, it's getting bigger, it's getting stronger, and no other animal is going to touch this ram. This ram is cleaning house. This ram is, is, is it has a sound uh, head on its shoulders. It knows what it's doing. It's collectively dominating. Okay, collectively dominating, and no one's going to uh, believe they can defeat this country, or this what would be a country, but this animal. Okay, now when it comes to prophecy, and we see uh, countries as we look now to as we studied in, in Ezekiel, as we look to Magog and these countries, have you noticed? Have you noticed in the seven countries of Magog? the arrogance that many of them are speaking with today could care less what our Secretary of State John Kerry has to say could care less what President Obama has to say and quite frankly could care less what any of the presidential candidates have to say they are becoming uh, unified and they're driven by purpose and anyone that stands in their way are going down okay that's these nations uh, it's very, you can see that in the aggression, of course, the political candidates are out there talking about we need to take the bull by the horn and um, maybe they, we should say take the ram by the horn. We need to, we need to, uh, we need to, 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 to change our global worldview here and begin to watch this stuff and, and rather than sit back and do nothing like we did with Hitler for the first five years when, a, when we were just appeasing all over the place and we had this man killing Jews, uh, uh, cooking them in ovens. I mean, this is, this is a very similar thing. This is what the ram was doing and, and no one was going to uh, stop them because of their greatness. That's the illustration that Daniel is trying to per, per, portray here to us. Nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. Okay, no, none that could, um, none that could stop this ram. He did according to his will and became great. Okay, now we're going to see specifically what this means when we read the interpretation of the vision. Okay, I just want to make sure we understand the vision. That it, I mean, this is significant. Every detail that Daniel gives us would be fulfilled uh, from uh, Greece and Persia. Uh, okay, but I want us to understand and relate it to modern day with what we studied in Ezekiel, so we can see the pieces and the credibility. It's it should almost sound like deja vu to you when when you understand this. Verse number five. And I was considering, 
suddenly a male goat from the west across the surface of the whole earth. Let me, I love this piece as a student of history. This tells us that a goat, a male goat, meaning it's going to have a male leader. Now this is significant, one, because of the Queen of Sheba and then Cleopatra and other female leaders that would, that would rise to, to power, okay? But here, a male goat from the west, meaning a country on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea would dare to take on the ram. Now that's extremely significant, okay? Extremely significant that another country from the west was at some point going to uh, take on the ram. Now, of course, if you put that together with Daniel 7 with the vision of the four beasts, we know that's going to be the leopard who comes to power quickly, which, of course, Daniel already knows is Greece. Okay, but Daniel, through this vision, is going to be told and therefore tell us in God's word how this is going to unfold. The reason I want to explain this to you is if Daniel was this specific when it came to defining Alexander the Great and his people, the Greeks, you better believe every detail is going to be carried out when it comes to defining the Antichrist and the future leaders during the second coming of Christ and the tribulation. These details are so specific, which also tells us it's God and not the devil. It's not a fairy tale. It wasn't just a guessing game. History un unfolds here um, very, uh, very specifically, um, you know, in time, therefore we have again the credibility, okay, across the surface of the whole earth. Now this tells us here too that this is going to be a different type of people. It's not just, okay, the western part of Israel, it's going to be a different culture, a different surface of the earth, meaning the Greeks were not going to have uh, olive skin or the male goat, I should say. This country is not going to be a typical superpower like had been reigning with, if you look at the superpowers, okay, you have uh, Mesopotamia, Asia Minor, uh, the Hittites, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, uh, the Persians. These six previous countries that were world superpowers uh, since the fall of, of Israel, all these different countries that ruled the roost, they were all of the seed of Ishmael. Okay? This is going to tell us, when it comes from a different part of the earth, that the, the nation that rises up to take out this ram with a horn is going to be a country that is not Arab. A country that is going to be different. And of course we know that country to be the Greeks. Alright? And so, uh, and here... Uh, without touching the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Okay? So what does this mean? This means that, and we're going to get to specifically, but this means we're going to have two horns. We're going to have a horn on a goat, a much smaller animal, a less aggressive animal, that's going to appear to be, again, the Patriots and the Pee Wee football team. You know, uh, it's or, or certainly the Kansas City Chiefs yesterday went into Texas and I don't know what happened to the Texans, but they chose not to show up and lost got 30 to nothing. But you have you have this nation that this goat with a horn that's going to look to fight. It's not going to come in there underestimating who they're up against. They're going to have a great boldness that they as the underdog can win. Almost sounds like, you know, when David took on Goliath. All right, and that's exactly what Alexander the Great would have would be amazing confidence. Okay, and history certainly tells us this. Okay, but this 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 goat is going to have a horn too, and this is symbolic of battle. Okay, this is going to be uh, something that uh, is is it's not going to be. Uh, just a, a freak thing. It's not just going to be, a, like I said, a fairy tale of Peter Pan or and Captain Hook. This is going to be an actual uh, battle between two nations represented by two animals. Okay? And, of course, any of us here 
would theoretically know, or logically know, I should say, that if a ram is in a fight with a goat, the ram's probably going to win. Okay? That's most likely how that goes now. Except when you bring God into the equation. Okay? And so, uh, and I've been in many world history classes in my day, and I've taught many classes in my day, even in uh, non-Christian when I was at St. Mary's College in St. Mary's City, Maryland, where I got my, my BA degree, the teachers are completely dumbfounded explaining this. And I wish, because I didn't get saved until after I had this class, but I wished I had known Daniel's, Daniel's word at the time to be able to say, I know you're dumbfounded, Professor Stevens, or Professor, Sa professor Savage was the professor I had then. I know you're dumbfounded, but let me just explain. This is God's word, which I would do the year later with Professor Stevens, but I, that was all in U.S. history classes by the time I got saved. I got the world history out of the way first because I really didn't like it in those days. I wanted U.S. history, but I got them done my freshman year of college. But this is, this is does everyone understand what he has seen? A notable horn between his eyes. Okay, now this is significant. Remember, the ram has two horns, one higher, one longer, longer than the other. But the goat has one between his eyes, meaning his vision is going to be precise, and his vision is going to be what enables him to bring forth victory against the ram. Okay, where there is no vision, the people perish. If you cannot see, you're going to walk blind, therefore you might have problems when it comes to effectiveness in this world. Okay, and so vision is very important. Okay, and if you have if you have vision, okay, and you can see the horn that is between you and the defense that you are in uh, and ready to take on the ram uh, is going to be. Uh, you obviously have to be able to uh, see. Uh, praise the Lord. Okay, does everyone see what Daniel's telling us right here? Does everyone see uh, have have the visual uh, in your head? Okay, because. Daniel was very precise. Okay, verse number 6. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. Now, as a student of history and as a teacher of history, this is something that's completely unprecedented. If there is an underdog country that is looking to defeat the superpower, they typically try to outmaneuver bait and maneuver, hide and seek, you know, hit and run, sneak in the back door. With Alexander the Great and the Goat of Greece, when it comes to defeating the Persians, which is the ram in this case, he's running at them. He's looking to defeat them, almost as King David did, you know, he wasn't trying to, you know, do some trickery or anything like that. You know, he is, he is taking on the enemy at hand, and that's exactly what Alexander the Great would do. Alexander the Great would look at Cyrus the Third, and he would look at the Persians and defeat them at their own game. Daniel saw this happening 200 years before it happened. He ran at the the goat ran at the ram with furious power. Now this fury is obviously a strategy and unification, but they came with everything they had. Basically, with the mindset, may the best man win. Now, this is significant, again, because it gives us credibility of prophecy when it comes to the last days and what, how things are going to happen uh, with certain countries, as we studied in Ezekiel, okay, that every detail, every T is going to be crossed, every I is going to be dotted. Uh, Mariah, Paula has a question there, okay? Welcome, Holly, to Praise Assembly. It's good to see you. Well, the only thing I was wondering, it says his feet didn't touch the ground. He ran straight for Persia. To me, that suggests he didn't bother with anything else but just, you know, focusing on... Correct. That with Correct. Him. Yes. Got to hit the road running. Uh, you know, it's kind of like when we say, um, I, I drove to a certain place and I don't think my tires ever hit the ground. Mm -hmm. Meaning you were driven by motivation to get there no matter what you had to do. You were pedal to the metal, and, you know, occasionally your tires came down and touched the ground. I mean, you're flying, okay? And certainly, uh, the, the goat here uh, is going to uh, be driven with a purpose, okay? 
and they're, they're coming across the Mediterranean, they're coming across into Elam, they're coming across where the ram is, and uh, it's again, it's a David Goliath. Remember, in, with King Saul's army, there was no one that would take on Goliath. There's no one that's taking on the ram. And certainly, nobody trying to sneak in the back door to defeat this country, which of course would be Persia. Okay, and so uh, here is Alexander the Great. Here are the Greeks coming into uh, to defeat with furious power, and they're motivated. They're unified. There's no division. Alexander the Great is one of the most prestigious and interesting world superpowers this world has ever seen. But Daniel had predicted his greatness 200 years before he was born. I mean, that to me, by the time when Daniel was predicting it, you know, the Greeks were still wrapped up in mythology and, and all this other They were confused. They were in turmoil. They had problems. You, you know, you had, uh, you had the, the Spartans and the Athens. I mean, you had all different things going on, you know. But by the, here is Daniel predicting this goat who would become great. And, of course, he would die just a few weeks before his 33rd birthday. A lot of parallels between Alexander the Great and Jesus, and a lot of, obviously, uh, contrast as well. Yeah, that was the intervention. Sore, so, To stunt that. Yes, well, again, well, Daniel already told us uh, with the leopard, they would come to power quickly, and they would die off quickly. Right. And that, they're, that they're, after the death of the goat, the power would be left in the four winds, which Alexander the Great left his power to the four governors, the east, south, north, south, east, and west. And they fell off the truck to the Romans, you know, uh, and and have never regained. Actually, the Greeks have never regained. Uh, I mean, look at what they're doing now. They had a big bailout, you know, and, and all the stuff. The Greeks are the Greeks have been in trouble. I would argue, kind of like the French. You know, the French never recovered from from World War One or World War Two, and uh, you know the the Greeks in the same way. Verse seven. Uh, yes, uh, Brian Mary has a question there. And I see similarity too. The Lord intervened when Hitler was really out of control against his people. Yes, well, certainly, certainly. It's almost like Carolus. Yes, and, and praise God that the Lord did intervene and, of course, had to fulfill the prophecy and the promise he had with Abraham to protect his people. And um, But Hitler, of course, had a lot of success in killing so many. Visit the Holocaust Museum, but don't eat first. I can tell you that. Skip lunch that day because it is a very... It's, yeah, you'll lose it walking in the Holocaust Museum. Verse 7, And I saw him, the goat, confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. Wow! Here is a goat taking on the superpower of the ram with two horns that no one ever dare even confront. And now the goat is moved is filled with rage, attacked the ram, and broke the two horns, including the larger one that was not visible until the end, uh, if you remember from today's lesson. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground, trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Wow! I mean, just, just unprecedented. You know, just, that, I mean, for our sake, that would be... That would be like, you know, if, if Puerto Rico, which is a U.S. territory, decided to secede from the U.S. and came in and defeated us, the United States. That's how that would be. I mean, that's the symbolism, you know, with the Greeks at this time coming on across the Mediterranean and coming, you know, across into Elam and coming across and defeating the ram, defeated the horde, defeated where its power came from, its unity. It's bulliness. It's leadership that was basically, we're better than anybody else, get out of our way. But as Solomon writes, pride goes before destruction, and destruction before the fall. Okay, and so, uh, and cast him down to the ground, trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Okay, and so, uh, pretty, uh, pretty amazing. And so in just this one defeat, we have a new champion. We have a new champion. Because there's no other nations around because no one is, you know, everybody has retreated. Persia is the superpower of the world. There's no one following them to try to defeat them. So once the goat comes in and takes care of business, 
by their dominance. And, and to the world's going to look at that and say, if Alexander the Great can take them out, what will they do to us? And they just backtrack until, of course, Rome. But it makes you wonder, had Alexander the Great lived a little bit longer other than 32 years old, he only reigned for 12 years. And if he had, and if he had lived a little bit longer, you know, it would have, I mean, obviously we know Rome, the unique beast, would have overtaken eventually because Daniel's prophecy would be fulfilled, of course. You know, but it would just it would just be as, as far as until when. But Alexander the Great didn't live long enough to do that. All right, so um, verse 8. Therefore the male groat grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. The large horn that's on this goat is going to be Alexander the Great himself. And when that is broken, Alexander the Great was poisoned. Whether or not it was murder is up to various uh, debate. Okay? Uh, but once the large horn is broken, okay, the large horn is broken, the four winds are the four that are going to uh, come uh, to power to replace it are the four governors of Greece. They would take Greece in four different directions and Greece would fall from power. Now, how cool is that? Daniel predicts that 200 years later and that's exactly what happened. Pick up any world history book, Christian, non-Christian, biblical worldview, secular worldview. That to me you have to take the prophecy of God's word literal. Okay? And that's really what Daniel's going to do. And then when John on the Isle of Patmos writes Revelation under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and he takes the groundwork that Daniel has already given us, and the credibility, it's like we now have all the figures all the way up to the second coming of Christ. Now, if we fall for this replacement theology... We're going to get ourselves big time confused, which is what the adversary wants. Guys, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Just know the word. And this works in every civilized country and every uncivilized country on that map back there. Okay? The word of God is huge. And for such a time as this, we have been called. Just as Daniel was called. Just as Esther. Mordecai told Esther. For such a time as this, you have been called. Well, we have been called. All right, and so uh, Daniel is explaining this, and this just this just gets me so excited because it's like, wow, Lord, every detail is going to unfold. This is what you did leading up to the first advent of Christ. You're certainly going to do it for His second advent. And you know what I think? A lot of this stuff with replacement theology and changing names and replacing Jews with Christians and all that stuff um, is because folks really aren't ready to meet the Lord. Because if you were, Jesus said, be waiting and watching. Jesus said, have oil in your lamp when the groom comes. Be ready. But if you're in denial, you, try, you kind of just buy yourself time. But I can tell you, the trump's going to sound. And I pray that each one, every one of us will have oil in our lamp. Because that's what the parable of the ten virgins. Don't ask me for some of my oil. Because I'm not giving it to you. Jesus is on the scene. I'm not missing the wedding. And I'm his bride. Pretty cool. <laughs> when you look at the pieces as are unfolded in the word. Last verse that we're going to study today. Verse 9. And out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. Which uh, the glorious land, of course, referring to Israel. But we are going to pick up the interpretation next week. Okay, so we have a, a little horn coming out of the, uh, the goat. Okay, um, and, uh, and it's going to be, it's going to be, it grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. So notice with the ram's horns, they covered the west, the south, and the north, and not the east. Now this horn, though, is covering some different directions here. 
We're covering the south, the east, and the glorious land. Okay, so we're going to pick that up next week, uh, which is the 17th, to understand what that significantly means when Daniel has, or God has Gabriel interpret this vision to Daniel. All right, any comment or question before we break for 10 minutes? Okay, so next week, guys, if you could read down through verse 27, um, that, would be, uh, that would be great uh, if you could do that. I don't think we'll get that far because we didn't really get down to verse 12 where I was hoping to uh, this morning, uh, but we're out of time. But if you could at least read down to verse 27, uh, you'll get the interpretation of the vision, and I pray that it will make a lot more sense, especially with knowing the history piece. A uh, reason so many don't like the prophetic books Ezekiel, Daniel, Isaiah, uh, all of them actually except Jonah. That seems to be the one just because it's a kid's story a lot of times. But the, the um, uh, knowing the history gives a better understanding, especially when countries still exist today, like Persia is modern-day Iran, Babylon, modern-day Iraq, Greece, of course, still exists today. Okay, and these countries uh, still still thrive, and so I hope that everyone has a clear picture of what's going on here in Daniel chapter eight with the vision of the ram and the goat. Okay, let's have a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you. For Hello, thanks for watching today's message. Appreciate you taking the time to listen to each word of God as shared here today. I'd also like to take this time to invite you to our weekly services, Sunday school for all ages at 9 a.m. Worship at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. with Children's Church at 10 a.m. Also, we have a special men's and women's group at 5 p.m. on Sundays. During the week, we have several services as well. We have an extra innings class with me, Pastor Justin, on Tuesdays at 10. Uh, also, uh, Tuesday nights at 7 p.m., we have a special class on Israel and the Book of Acts. Wednesday, we have a love and respect class for married couples at 10 a.m. Also, on Wednesday night, we have our family night for all ages at 6.30 p.m. And lastly, we have our food pantry on Thursdays with servings at both 10 and 11 a.m. May God richly bless you today. Thanks again for watching.